Is it still in there? God, that's hard. I think all of us that went through it, myself, there's a lot of it still in here. You go, you live through that time. Uh, it's like you live through all times. You learn. You learn a lot. What I learned was is invaluable to me today. Is your life better for having lived through the sixties? Yeah, I had a really chance to examine myself and find out who I am and what I'm about. Uh, that was the reason I, I left home to start with. Find out who I was. Yeah, and it's, yeah, sure, it's, yeah, it's part of me. I finally left the communes and moved back to the Forbidden City. And from there, I still live in a city today. But I found the commune I was always dreaming of. It's called the Kingdom of God. And now I've got an everlasting high. And I know I came a different way than many do, but I've got the 60s to thank in a way, and I've got that whole crazy time to thank because in a way, it's what jolted me into a place where I could finally behold the Lord. I felt I might be morally bankrupt if I had ambition, or if I, God forbid, work towards making one of my boyfriends want to marry me. All of that seemed wrong. I felt I was endlessly resilient and life was longer than it would be. That I had uh, the rest of my life to make up my mind about a lot of things. Uh, I'm single, I've never married. So, uh, um, and I've, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm past, I think, childbearing years, except with great Magilla to get, you know, <laughs> which I'm not willing to do. I think when I was doing the things that I did in the 60s, I felt like I had no other choice. I was so relieved when it was over and I could get out of it and I was um, deliriously happy to be able to come back and join the system and work from within it to make a difference as opposed to being outside. I think I've changed. I mean, my life has taken directions that I never would have imagined were possible. Especially when I became a conscientious objector and a, and a potential war resistor, then I thought that a career for me in the in the sort of in mainstream institutions was was impossible. Well, then it turned out I, I ended up being the chief speechwriter of the president of the United States, and now I'm editor of a fairly well-known uh, national magazine. I have never made more than. $15,000 a year as a teacher. Most of the time it's been considerably less than that. I write. I have never made more than $13,000 a year as a writer. And I didn't make that 13 and that 15 in the same year, so <laughs> my, my combined income has never exceeded more than $20,000. Um, I've spent, I've walked away from a lot of opportunities that might have made my life a whole lot more secure because I felt that they were simply not, well, one hates to use this word, but because I felt as though to have taken those opportunities would have been to sell out to the values that I acquired. I didn't know what to think anymore. I didn't know what to believe. I didn't know what to espouse. I didn't know what to wear. I was really just kind of lost. And I was also, by, at that point, uh, getting divorced. And uh, so I did go back and live with my parents for a while. And I did try on, uh, literally tried on some polyester pantsuits, and I kind of tried that out to see, well, do I just kind of go back all the way? Or, and it really wasn't me anymore. I really had gone. I had just gone too far the other, the other way. I moved to a small rural town for many years and tried to grow a big garden, did some hunting and fishing. And uh, I considered myself conservative at the time, even reactionary. Uh, and uh, 
but at the same time, most people describing my life would have said he's one of those 60s dropouts doing the, doing the rural thing. Although I myself was sitting around reading Southern Agrarians who saw the automobile as a symbol of the country going to hell. And of course they were right. So, uh, so I, I, I guess it's not that big a leap uh, going from being radical to reactionary. You know, but that's that's what happened to me. Of course, as every girl, I have aspirations to someday be married and raise a family and to someday be in love with someone very, very much so that even after I'm past 30, <laughs> even after I'm past 30, there's something to live for because you have someone to give your life to, someone to do things for. Back in 1960, most young people had a clear vision of what their future families would be like. At that time, 70% of American families had a breadwinning dad, a housekeeping mom, and one or more kids. But today, only 15% of American families fit that description. The dream I had from childhood was to have a loving family unit that lived together forever. I mean, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, to do all those all American kind of things with my kids. The boys work on the truck with the dad and the kids are, you know, out there gardening with the mom and, you know, to do those things together as a family unit. And the thing that I have to face that hurts the most is the fact that I couldn't go on with that family unit. That hurts. Of all the revolutions that occurred in the 1960s, the most lasting uh, the one with the greatest impact were the changes that it brought about in private life. The protests against the Vietnam War rose and then fell. Uh, public concern about civil rights uh, rose and then sadly ebbed. But the changes that occurred in American private life lasted. In fact, they became even more intense in the early 1970s and they persist even till today. So American families are fundamentally different than they were a decade and a half ago. Divorce is much more common. Uh, many people lament that, but there's clearly a good side about that. That is, people do not have to remain in loveless marriages that people felt compelled to remain in in the 1950s. Attitudes toward marriage and divorce are not the only social norms to be shattered by the experiences of the 60s. Back in 1959, 90% of American adults agreed that the only proper time to discover intimate details about a partner was after the matrimonial knot had been tied. Today, one of every two Americans acknowledges that living together before marriage is a good idea. I haven't changed politically one little bit, not budged one bit since I was in World War II. I still feel very strongly about a strong defense and, uh, you know, I'm not going to review all that, but, but uh, sexually, uh, now if I'd had a little girl, I might have felt differently, you know, and we filled up the house with boys trying to get a little girl, but uh, boys, uh, uh, I think that uh, it, uh, I am, I've changed. I wouldn't hesitate to say, go ahead, if you want to live with her, go ahead. If it's all right with her, and see how it works out. And if it's right, you get married. And if you don't, you'll know. So there was no real hand done, just a little time wasted. <laughs> Physical desire is very normal, and it happens, and it's, sometimes everything just comes down to a very basic level, and there's nothing wrong with it. I think that sex is just much groovier when there's love, you know. There's a lot more happening. But there's nothing wrong with just sex for sex. The sexual revolution. One thing this open and permissive experiment with sex dramatically changed was the great American double standard. The percentage of men who say they had sex before marriage has increased slightly over the years. But since the 60s, the percentage of women who say they've had sex before marriage has nearly doubled. But clearly, that's not all the sexual revolution of the 60s changed. Well, actually, the sexual revolution was the most widespread and most long-lasting of all the legacies 
of the 60s, I mean the polls in 1970 showed radical changes in sexual behavior and mores, not just among hippies and college students on the two coasts, but blue collar workers in Texarkana and Des Moines. It was very widespread, it permeated entire culture. Well, you know, I've written a book that was originally titled The End of Sex, an all time worst title for a book, <laughs> but it was really about uh, the end of the obligatory sexuality and I have criticized the sexual revolution so I'm on that side too and yet I can say very clearly that it was it was a, one of those long overdue revolutions that people that had certain types of sexual desire that they felt they could never speak to another human being it could always had to be locked within within themselves they held these seemingly guilty secrets and you know all of life was sort of constrained by the fact that they had this secret and there was no one to talk to no way to express it I am amazed when I look around me now at how freely uh, we can in the media, uh, in the society generally, in, uh, in, in polite society, uh, around a dinner table or at lunch and in my classrooms, we can talk about matters of sexuality that could never be talked about openly uh, through the 40s, 50s and even up into the early 60s. Uh, our willingness to um, accept many different um, uh, sexual preferences, lifestyles in our society is much greater. The range of social tolerance is much greater than it was before. Most of my college life, sex was terrible. Um, I found myself um, uh, always in that awful situation that women found themselves before the women's movement of basically having to sort of say no and being sort of called on it and everything was sort of tense and, and, and difficult and so you tried to have intellectual relations with someone with people that weren't sexual and, and then there were other people who had a lot more sex and probably a lot more fun but for me sex was a terrible trauma I think we didn't have the tools to really use it well and I think the real problem with the 60s counterculture <laughs> was that most of us who in experienced it were still adolescents and so therefore we didn't have the, the stuff to really get off with it. When you go back and you watch a videotape or from the 60s, it looks gross, it looks dirty. Everybody looks dirty and sloppy and messy and foul-mouthed and you know you sort of want to scratch yourself when you see it. You know, and was that, was it so important to us not to take a bath? You know, how important was that? That was childish. Of course we were children, so I suppose we had an excuse. The biggest regret is foolishly alienating the working class. That's the number one regret. Because we had at that time no concept of divide and conquer. No concept that those people might be important allies and that it was not worth alienating them for really childish issues like the right to use four letter words, you know, or the right to flaunt your sexuality. Um, I mean, I will, I will censor this quote a little bit, but the leader of the farm, Stephen Gaskin, said that the Reagan era was paying us back for doing it in the streets, and next time we'll try to make our revolution a little bit more serious and substantial and deal with social issues. hasn't occurred at this university in a good long time. We're going to have real classes up there. But there are going to be freedom schools conducted up there. We're going to have classes on First and Fourteenth Amendment. One place where the young people of the 1960s did make serious and substantial changes was on the college campus. It's a curious irony that some of those who once actively protested against administration policies have themselves become professors and university administrators. Dr. Arthur Levine. We did a study a few years ago to look at what happened to all the reforms of the 60s. And they included things like new and relevant courses. Those new and relevant courses are still there. Looked at areas that had come into the curriculum, like uh, ethnic studies, like women's studies. Those things are still there. We created things like interdisciplinary majors, which brought a variety of fields together. Those are still there in equal numbers. We created things like independent study, which let a student study with a faculty member alone on an issue of interest to the student. Those are still there in the same proportion. We created new kinds of grading systems, pass-fail grading for some courses. That's still there in the same proportion or higher. So all the reforms of the 60s have just been layered upon 
but haven't disappeared. So in a lot of ways, the 60s formed at least an important part of what the curriculum is today. The things that hurt about the 60s are that there really was an anti-intellectualism in which we said all people and all ideas are equal. They're not. That was a hurtful kind of response. In a lot of ways, it's reminiscent of the Red Guard in China in the 60s and 70s, in which they threw out the important ideas and turned their universities into places that no longer discovered truth, no longer disseminated truth. Well, just think of setting them down in front of Bill and saying, Bill, look, I made these myself. Well, now, what do you think he'd say? <clears throat> Bill! Bill Porter! I'll tell you what he'd say. He'd say I knew my wife was beautiful. I knew she had brains. But I never realized she had such talent. Say, that looks good. When do we eat? <laughs> It's absolutely better. I, I'm unequivocal about that. It is better to be a woman today. To say that it's easy, I wouldn't say that it's easy. To say that the feminist revolution is complete, I wouldn't say that for a minute. On the other hand, I know my, my own life would be different had I been born at a different time. My life would resemble my mother's, and I wouldn't want that for myself. On the other hand, I claim to be one of those women who want it all and who refuses to give up any piece of it and just con continues to batter away at the uh, restrictions that are still out there and, and I'm determined to hang on one way or another. Although 54% of women in America feel their lives are better than 20 years ago, 75% think it's harder for marriages to succeed and 80% say it's harder to raise children. We have come a long ways. And yet we really haven't, we don't have utopia, and there, not that there ever will be. I think today that a woman is very productive on the job, very responsible on the job, and she gets home and she is still wife and mother. And I think she's still going home and making sure that she has done the grocery shopping, she's making sure that there is food on the table, and she's making sure that the house is clean. The reality, and our Gloria Steinem has said it, the reality is that what women's liberation means by 1990 is that women wind up doing more because men haven't moved in to blurred sex roles. And this isn't just a woman sitting here complaining. Survey after survey among men uh, has men acknowledging that they haven't picked up the slack on home and child rearing. So we have women, baby boom women, going into the 1990s with a new economic prospect of outlook that says they have to be working to earn some money, but that also says family is now more important to me. I want to have children or I have children. I want to spend more time with them. There are things that have to get done in the household that don't get done. He's not going to do it. We now have many single women uh, who are parents, so there isn't even the question of a man picking up the slack. And women are under a significant amount of stress. Women's liberation has obviously worked in the sense that more women really have good job opportunities, that women's incomes in many, many spheres are better. It's worked in a lot of ways, but it hasn't been perfect. And the legacy is stress. And women in the 90s are going to be about resolving that stress by making some choices about what roles they're going to play. The 1950s concept of work had changed by the end of the 1960s not only in terms of stress, but because of a 60s sensibility that work should be a means of self-expression and fulfillment, that a person should get more from a job than simply a paycheck. I think this is one of the best things, the best holdovers personally for me, is I've followed my heart's desires. I haven't fallen into the trap of you have to make money doing this and that and money's a god. It's not. the being self-satisfied in the sense that what you're doing in life is important and going to pass something on to another generation is much more important to me and i believe that i learned all that in the sixties especially the sense that i want some part of me to affect somebody else in life later on 
I've noticed is people who went to school during that era, like 68 through 73, share a set of values and a set of understandings that people on either side, younger and older, just don't get. And so when you're in the workplace uh, and uh, you're talking about uh, idealism, that people of that generation have a certain sense of idealism that things can and should be better, right down to the details of how people treat each other day to day and that that there's a political component to day to day interaction and experience it's just it's a perspective that we have and when you go into the workplace with other people uh... who may be just a few years older a few years younger and talk that way they look at you like you're a martian pay our actors five dollars a performance you can live on twenty five dollars a week that's assuming you're doing something you're interested in and something that's valuable. If you're not doing anything that's interesting, then you got to get a lot of money, Mac. you got to make a fortune to keep a boring job. That 60s attitude led many working Americans to feel that money was not the only important career goal. That each individual should set his or her own standards for determining what success means. But although many today strive for a more fulfilling work life, the way the 60s generation measures success has stayed essentially the same. A recent Rolling Stone magazine survey revealed that most members of the 60s generation were surprised by how career-oriented they had become and perplexed by how much the system they tried to change changed them. Only the promise of, of a material affluence, only the promise of, of two cars, only the promise of a split level divided again and again and again in suburbia after suburbia after suburbia. That's the only thing that this, that this culture can offer people now. Bread alone. Now, the question is whether or not you're going to accept that. I shared a blazing contempt for everything that America seemed to pride itself in, that is to say straight middle America. Uh, since then, I think I've learned to appreciate better the, the terrific labor, the industry, and good luck that are required for the, uh, the perdure of that dream. It looks shakier these days, and the culture that could achieve some confidence in its ability to provide the nice house on the nice street, the nice school, the nice college education, the nice job. The confidence of such a culture seems uh, more, of a, more of an achievement than it did. It seemed to come without effort, but now I understand there was a lot of effort and a lot of chanciness to it. The American middle class, um, with respect to its orientation toward money, success, uh, family life, and so on, has certainly proved to be far more tenacious than anybody would have predicted uh, in the middle of the, the, the countercultural rebellion of the 60s. I mean, if you go back and look at some of the underground newspapers of, of that period, um, they are filled with a sense that everything can be changed overnight in, in America. And you know, the, the walls are going to come tumbling down, we're going to transform the society totally until the, you know. Now, th this, well, I felt this was far fetched at the time. But even I would not have um, predicted how, how tenacious um, the, uh, the American corporation is, the American middle class way of life is. Um, you don't overturn something like that. You, can, you change it around the edges, and perhaps you infuse it with some, more val uh, some new values, but you don't um, simply get rid of it, scrap it, within a single generation. Now I've got a two-story house, I've got a family, I've got two cars, I'm comfortable. It's hard to draw about poverty. It's hard to draw about the difficulties of making it. It's hard even to draw about the things I really care deeply about because they don't really affect my life as viscerally as they used to. And, and that has an effect. It has a real effect on you. You begin asking the old questions from the 60s. You begin saying to yourself again, what's this all about? Do you really need the house? Do you really need the cars? Do you really need the money? Are you better off living closer to the edge? Do you really live life any other way but there? And I don't have the answer to it. There's no way to go back. There's no way to, there's no way to do it again. I don't know if I have the energy to do it again. But that, those, 
Those 60s questions will nag me for the rest of my life. I think people have become just a little um, disabused with the notion that uh, integration was going to solve the problems, that voting was going to solve the problems, that voting rights, that is, that uh, being able to sit down in a drugstore next to a white person drink a cup of coffee had any real meaning. It, 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 things had changed, but these only surface changes. It, the, the, I think the, they were far, uh, they were deep things that remained unchanged and uh, it didn't, didn't have to be particularly bright to see how many corporations didn't have any black representation or how few airlines had a black pilot flying uh, or, or even the railroads have any black engineers on the railroad even today. Um, so I think maybe people began to see that and they began to question, was it worth it? Was it really worth it? What we witnessed in the 60s was a wholesale abandonment of the black community by the black community. In other words, we bought into integration as opposed to desegregation. And so we integrated ourselves out of our own colleges, out of our own medical schools, out of our own businesses, out of our own baseball teams. There was a wholesale abandonment of our own institutions that sustained us through slavery, through segregation, through discrimination, through bigotry. The, all those institutions within our community that sustained us, uh, that, that provided the moral glue that kept us going, that this was just torn asunder in the name of uh, integration. And I think the black community today continues to pay a heavy price for what we gained in the civil rights movement. If you had told me in Watts in 65 when I was there, with every government there was, the city government and the county government and the state government and the U.S. government, all saying, we're going to fix Watts. Nobody could have told me that either going back there in the 88 campaign with Jackson and Watts would be worse. That all that stuff that people said that they were going to put in isn't there. You mean worse? You're worse, not worse, worse. The drugs have their hands so deep in that community. And people said, don't, they said, Jesse, don't come in. And Jesse, it's too dangerous for you to come in. But Jesse went in. And so, and he, and he had a meeting with the, the kids' uh, gangs in Watts. And there were kids there who were just strung out on drugs. There were kids there who, who had gold ropes on their necks and beepers uh, that, that all of them victims of the drug business in one way or another and they were saying it to Jesse as they would have said to no other human being on this earth uh, it, uh, things that were in their heart my mind I know it's wrong Reverend I know it's wrong Reverend but I, I, I just there's nothing else to do Reverend I another guy said I know it's wrong I, that people shouldn't be using these things but Reverend I got to sell them because my, 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 I pay my rent for my mother and I pay my rent for my aunt well you know now that partly that is that is rationalization you know that but you also know it's true that that they are engaging in the only economic opportunity and uh, others say oh I'm I'm, I'm alright Reverend I'm, I'm going to get it together tomorrow Reverend and you know I mean these kids are just done the hideous thing about it the hideous thing for me that was ripping my heart was that all these people were born after 1965. They were all born after I was there and after we were going to do all that stuff. That I would never have expected to see. And that's heartbreaking. That's heartbreaking. We neglected the next generation and nobody instilled in them values and social responsibility that they needed to become effective, constructive participants in today's society. That is the fault of my generation, that we didn't leave that consciousness and that obligation or social responsibility as a legacy, not only to the college students of today, but to the non-college students of the day more so, you know, because they are the ones that are the real custodians of our society, especially the society of, of urban America. Here's where it's important to, 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 to step back and look at what's happened. This country lived quite comfortably, except for black people, with racism for 300 years. It's going to take more than 25 or 30 years to root it all out. It's going to continue to take struggle. 
White people have uh, changed in some fundamental ways, but there are still deep pockets of racism left. It would have been extraordinary if beginning, let's say, in 1964, when the first uh, historic Civil Rights Acts were passed, if beginning in that period, uh, with hard work, there had been one straight continuum, and lo and behold, a quarter century later, it was all gone. You never would know that there had been segregation. No way to do it that fast. I'm not always sure that the country has the kind of energy and commitment to keep at it until we, in fact, eliminate it all. And the 80s uh, lowered the morale in the black community so bad you would have thought for some that we had gone back to the 1930s or the 1920s. I never thought that because I'm not going that way. I'm not going back psychologically. I'm not going back actually. Uh, what I do recognize is that on the road to full freedom, there will be periods like the 80s. There will be leaders like Reagan. But I'm not going to let him destroy my morale, and I'm not going to let one decade convince me that we are in the same position our ancestors were uh, in Reconstruction. Because we're just not going to let it happen. The great society rests on abundance and liberty for all. It demands an end to poverty and racial injustice, to which we're totally committed in our time. The Democratic Party of 1964, the party of the Great Society, built a liberal coalition that struck a responsive chord with many Americans, especially young Americans. Yet an often acknowledged legacy of the 1960s is the fragmentation of that national democratic coalition and the subsequent control of the White House by the Republicans. What happened? People scratch their heads and try to wonder why it is that the Republican Party has dominated presidential politics since 1968. Simple answer. The civil rights movement and the turmoil of the 60s. And I'm not saying, oh yes, the political pendulum swung the other way in the conservative direction. No, it's more fundamental than that. What the civil rights movement did was dismantle a one-party South. The one party was the Democratic Party. And that allowed viable Republican Party organizations to spring up throughout the South. And that, more than anything, has been the cornerstone of the Republican Party ascension to political uh, to political prominence in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and into the 90s. Mr. Chairman, most delegates to this convention do not know that thousands of young people are being beaten in the streets of Chicago. And for that reason, and that reason alone, I request the suspension of the rules for the purpose of adjournment for two weeks to relocate the convention in another city. If you look back to the late 1960s and the early 1970s, and if you ask yourself what was the legacy of that time and of the of left-wing activity at that time, the legacy was the election of Richard Nixon in 1968, the emergence of Ronald Reagan and the conservative movement, and the election of Reagan in 1980 to the presidency. By 1968 and 1969, those of us who were active in the conservative movement knew for a fact that the ultimate result of what was going on was going to be just that. Whether it was going to be Nixon or Reagan was the question, but we knew that these people who were out there rioting in the streets were handing us the country. And for that, we have something to be grateful for. A teenager held up a sign, bring us together. And that will be the great objective of this administration at the outset, to bring the American people together. Since Richard Nixon's election, the Republican Party has dominated the presidency. But the victories they have enjoyed have been, and continue to be, tainted by fundamental changes in the way many Americans feel about their government. A recent survey suggests that 79% feel that politicians have lost touch with the people. I think that uh, certain patterns of thought were set that are still with us. Uh, for one thing, I think an extreme skepticism of any warlike move. I think that after Vietnam, it became almost impossible to get the American people embroiled in any war where there was no 
obvious direct threat. That's one. Number two, I think that the nation has been left uh, with a rather deep feeling of skepticism about its political leaders. Uh, part of that, I believe, was Nixon and uh, Watergate, which, of course, took place afterward. Uh, but I think that a great deal of it was due to what happened in Vietnam. Vietnam, a memory that continues to color the judgment and the outlook of the people who lived through it. What I learned in Vietnam, or as a result of Vietnam, is the way in which our government operates, which is very different from the way that we are taught it operates, very different from what I learned in public school in Perkinsy, Pennsylvania. And, the, ast and, and the, the astounding thing and the disappointing thing is that almost no one is willing to believe that people listen to someone like me talk and they go away thinking that guy's crazy I understand things in a way that I couldn't have understood before but the the problem with that is that it leaves me forever at odds with the culture and the society in which I live because The things which got us into Vietnam, and, and in fact, the things which have, uh, which created the crisis of the civil rights movement, uh, have not been resolved. I believe that America was right. I believe that we could have won the war. I believe the politicians were wrong. I believe that, you know, they did the whole thing wrong. Don't get in if you're not going to fight to win. If you're going to fight to win, we could have won. We could have went right on to Moscow, as far as I was concerned. Don't play games with my life, my brother's life, or the kids from my neighborhood. For what end? Toward what end? To how did it gain us? Why were we there in the first place? What was there to be gained to the average citizen? What would have constituted winning? Can you define that for me? It's real hard to win if you can't define what constitutes um, what constitutes winning, and that was the that was the damn problem. Is that once you decided to go in, it was in for a dime, in for a dollar. If you don't figure out before people start getting blown away, what is going to constitute winning, either in political terms or in geographic terms, you damn sure aren't going to figure it out when people start coming home in body bags. There's no question but what the country didn't go where some of us would have wanted it to go in terms of its particularly its sense of social justice at home, but also its sense of, uh, of abroad. But there is also no question but what today no one would try to ban the communist speaker on a college campus. Today no one would say you can't drink a cup of coffee at this lunch counter, you can't drink out of that drinking fountain. No one today would try for a minute to suggest that we should send a half a million troops to fight a war in Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Latin, any place in Latin America, I mean, pick the place. That, I mean, it, it is out of the question that the most conservative uh, legislator could conceivably, in their wildest imagination, suggest returning to the early 60s. Out of the question. We have moved way beyond that and won't move back. Americans from the 60s generation are on the move and select members of this group are ascending to positions of political leadership. But to what extent are Americans of any age willing to entrust those who took part in the experiences of the 60s with the ultimate responsibility for the nation's future? 
it remains to be seen whether a Vietnam era person will become president. If such a person does become president, I think it's now more likely that that person will be a Vietnam veteran than a veteran of the anti-war movement. Uh, most likely, really, would be a Vietnam veteran who is sympathetic to the anti-war movement. Uh, but, um, but I think we're at the very, at this moment, we're in a period of, of cultural reaction. It's not so severe that people, that, that it raises the specter of repression. But, uh, for example, uh, it does mean that people who are applying for government jobs when the FBI asked them, have they ever smoked marijuana? Uh, ten years ago, they would have said, yeah, sure. Now they're apt to say, no, no, not me. I never did, did that. Uh, so so uh, we are haunted. Our generation is a bit haunted by, uh, by our youthful follies, which are now, for some reason, they're, they're, har they're harder for, for the younger generation to understand, let alone the older generation. I think it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of uh, poignant irony that um, that uh, we're regarded in some ways by those younger in in a bit the same way that we were regarded by our parents and those older. It's just that now we don't have the glamour of youth anymore. Along with growing older comes one of the toughest challenges for the 60s generation. What to tell the kids? What to leave out? Some feel it's best not to talk about their wilder excursions away from mainstream values and behavior. But this is a generation that preached that parents should teach their children well, to be honest about feelings and values. Trying to make sense of the 60s for the next generation is a moment of truth. I have an eight-year-old son, and he already has had to confront my political activity currently. Uh, he was, when his first grade teacher asked him what his father did, he said, my father fights fascism, you know, which prompted a teacher-parent conference. Um, so, and I never told him to say that. But he is getting to the point now where he is asking some questions about that. And both my wife and I come out of the political movement of the 60s. And uh, both did a lot of uh, organizing and went through all those various uh, sexual and drug revolutions and it's hard it's hard to know what to answer because I don't want to lie to him but I don't want him to be hurt and I feel echoes of my parents when I say this because I don't want my kid to use crack I don't want my kid to use uh, hard drugs I don't know how to balance the things in the 60s that happened to me drugs were part of it um, to today so that part of the 60s, I don't know how to deal with. The rest of it, you bet, I talk to them all the time about it. And they ask about it. Because some of them are studying it in school now. And it's interesting to look at the books and hear what it says about the 60s. I mean, it's probably very much like my parents who looked at books about World War II that I was looking at when I was their age. And I want to tell them what the truth was. Or at least as I see it. Well, it's, it just doesn't have the emotion it doesn't have the feeling. It's sort of facts, and they aren't facts. It's much more than that. I walk my child through the town, and I take him across the pavement where it goes down like this, and I explain about that. And we pass, you know, we pass a sign, and it says, women working. You know? But he's seen that sign before. It has no charge for him. He can't imagine what it was like the first time one saw a sign, women working. You know, how to tell the young people how life is transformed. I've managed to raise myself from poverty into the middle class, even though I might not want to um, say I am, I am. Uh, the fact that I could do that as a black woman in this country and really says to me that we can do anything we want to do if we can organize and put our minds to it. And we can say that to the youth today, that you can do the same thing we did back in the 50s and in the 60s and in the 70s. My daughter, 
Julie is 18, registered to vote, a student at Sarah Lawrence College. I am worried about her because if she has $6 in her pocket and she sees a homeless person, I know they're going to get five. And she has been very concerned about studying the history and she's writing a, 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 a paper on the Freedom Democratic Party. She's very committed. She was, she was a volunteer at, the, at Georgetown Hospital here. She was, she's very committed to people. My son is very committed to the stock market. He says that, well, uh, while he likes he, myself and his mother and what we do, he thinks that we're wasting a lot of time on homeless people. And when they were young, they should have gotten newspaper uh, routes, saved their money. And if they have problems finding a job, he'll be glad to personally teach them how to work. And uh, I mean, so it's, it's just uh, some of my friends tell me, well, that's my, that's my punishment. Uh, but I, despite his politics, I, of course, love it. The question the 60s generation keeps struggling to answer, not only for their children, but for themselves, is what is the meaning of it all? How will history remember the 1960s? Each of the 180 participants, witnesses, and experts who contributed to this series was asked this same question. And while their specific answers varied greatly, almost everyone either talked about the 1960s impact on America or talked about the 1960s impact on themselves. The 60s impact on America was stated eloquently by Dr. Manning Marable. The 60s created a fundamental challenge and question to the very essence of what American democracy is all about. The 60s represented a fundamental question about the absence of material equality for poor people and people of color in the society. The 60s represented a cultural challenge to the conformity and the Velveetaization of American culture. The fact that we could be proud that we were so similar. The 60s said we should be happy that we are different. And within the difference, we find creativity, we find challenge and change, we find excitement and vibrancy. That is really the power of American society. The 60s was a fundamental challenge to what America had said about itself for so many generations. It was a lie built on top of a lie. Democracy didn't live for millions of African Americans, and equality was not real for the poor. The 60s forced America to look in the mirror at itself. And what it represents is the promise of American life in the future, because the questions the 60s raised still haven't gone away. When will those questions be answered? With the memories and passions from the 60s still stirring in so many, perhaps history won't be able to decide on the full impact of the 60s until the last member of the 60s generation has passed on. That's the sentiment of the second answer to the question about the real meaning of the 60s experience. An appreciation that, on a personal level at least, final assessments don't come easy. Carl Oglesby. And meantime, we had an experience which I suppose is unique in American history and which nobody who went through it will ever forget. Uh, it's an experience filled with treasured moments and nightmares alike to this day, all inter interwoven. And I think that it will always be this way. The 60s will never level out. It's a corkscrew, it's a tailspin, it's a joyride on a roller coaster. It's a never-ending mystery. Who won, who lost, what were the terms of victory and defeat? We'll always be discussing that. I think it was uh, an American, it was another civil war in a sense. And it has all the, the, the drama, the melodrama, the comedy, the pathos, above all, the confusion, the uncertainty as to outcome and meaning and significance that the Civil War of the 1860s had. Maybe it's just that in every 60s decade, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, we have to go through some crisis like this. But it was certainly... Uh, 
certainly not. We had us a time, and we're still trying to figure out what it was all about.